بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين نبينا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وإيمانا وتقا وإحسانا يا رب العالمين اللهم اجعل عملنا كلها صالحة ولوجهك خالصة ولا تجعل لأحد منه شيئا Let us begin by praising Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is always looking after us, providing for us, protecting us. And may Allah's peace and blessings be upon our leader, the Rahma for humanity, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And also upon his companions, the Tabi'un, the Tabu'ut Tabi'een, and all the Muslim believers who live until the Day of Judgment. I would like to remind myself and all of you of the importance of having good intentions. When we engage in good deeds, so that we will be rewarded for what we do. Because our deeds are valued by the intentions which lie behind those deeds. If we do a good deed but our intention is bad, then we are not going to be rewarded for it. Sometimes even a day-to-day -day activity that we engage in, which is not what we call religious, could become a religious form of worship and give us a lot of ajr, reward and thawab. If we recollect the purpose for which we are doing and to whom, for whom we are doing it. We are having our meals and when we have that meal, we do not think that this is an act of worship where we are going to be rewarded for each mouthful that we place in our mouth. But if we have the intention that we are eating for the sake of Allah so that Allah through this meal that I am having will strengthen my body and give me good health which will in turn help me to engage in a lot of worship. It will help me to work for the sake of Allah, for the cause of Islam. It will help me to help the weak people, to assist them in their difficult situations. If we have this intention while eating, then it is going to give us a lot of reward for each and every intention that we have during that time. So intention, this niya is something very important, which is why we find that the scholars, the fuqaha, when they mention the, the, the ways of doing ibadah, they always mention that the first step is to have niya. Have niya. Today we are disputing or engaging in debates as to whether this niya should be said or recited or mentioned. And finally what happens is that we totally give up this niya. We totally forget about the niya. And this will deprive us from a lot of khair, from a lot of goodness that we could get if we have this niya at the beginning of each and every act of worship. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this gathering a blessed gathering because we are here to study the kalamullah, the words of Allah, which are full of wisdom and we pray to Allah that he will give us that wisdom, enlighten us so that we will be able to 
practice the teachings of Islam and also convey that to the other people. Amen. We'll begin with the recitation of some verses of Surah Al Kahf. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي أنزل على عبده الكتاب أنزل على عبده الكتاب ولم يجعل له عوجا قيما لينذر بأسا شديدا من لدن ويبشر المؤمنين الذين يعملون الصالحات ويبشر المؤمنين الذين يعملون الصالحات أن لهم أجرا حسنا ما كثين فيه أبدا وينذر الذين قالوا اتخذ الله ولدا ما لهم به من علم ولا لآبائهم كبرت كلمة تخرج من أفواههم إن يقولون إلا كذبا صدق الله العظيم وصدق رسوله النبي الكريم ونحن على ذلك من الشاهدين Respected brothers and sisters in Islam We are with a very interesting chapter of this Quran which is Surah Al-Kahf and we gave a brief introduction about this Surah as well as uh, the background of the revelation of this Surah and also highlighted some of the important aspects that could be found in this surah. Today we'll go a little deeper into what this surah has within it, whether they are teachings, lessons, benefits, virtues, because there are a lot of hadiths that speak about the significance of this surah. If we go through those hadith, we will be able to understand that this surah benefits us in numerous ways. Number one, there are ahadith of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam relating this surah with a dajjal and uh, as reported by 
the famous companion Abu Darda radiallahu anhu Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said whoever memorizes the first ten ayah verses of this surah he will be protected from the jar and this is a sahih hadith which has been recorded in sahih muslim and several other books of hadith then there is another type of reward or benefit that we could gain by reciting this surah which also has been reported in several ahadith some of them are sahih where it is reported that prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that whoever reads surah al-kahf on the night of juma which is friday night he will have a light that will stretch from him up to the kaaba in makkah that means we all in our prayers we pray in the direction of kaaba even though it is, it lies several hundreds of miles away from us now allah is going to fill this entire path with light that will shine and this is not only a mark of respect but it is also a sign of enlightenment it is a sign of allah's presence with us so according to this hadith by reciting surah al-kahf we are illuminating that path which is before us and according to another narration which also has been reported by the famous sahabi abu sa'id al khudri radiyallahu anhu it will illuminate the person who recites that surah from one friday to the other friday if he re recites it every friday from one friday until he reaches the other friday this surah will be illuminating him now imagine you are in a dark room you are unable to walk about you are unable to see anything or find anything and then there is a very bright light that shines into the room and at once you are able to do whatever you want you feel a sense of freedom a sense of relief whereas when it was dark you were living in a very difficult situation so if allah is going to shine a light in our lives it means that our life is going to be easy for us we will know what we should do and how we should do we will know where we are going because everything has been illuminated and we are being guided on that path so this is the significance of this light and if we understand the meanings of this surah which we will be going through during these lectures we will understand the relation between these ahadith mentioning about light and what this surah has to say why is it that we are being rewarded with light with illumination for reciting this surah because the evil effects of the various challenges that face us in this life is similar to darkness and it is only a person who understands the teachings of this surah who will be able to come out of the darkness and this is the purpose of this religion to bring out people from darkness 
into light which is why we see in surah ibrahim allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins that surah by saying alif lam ra kitabun anzalnahu ilayk لِتُخْرِجَ النَّاسَ مِنَ الظُّلُمَاتِ إِلَى النُّورِ Alif Lam Ra It is a book that we reveal to you so that you may be able to bring out the people from darkness into light. That was the purpose why all the messengers were sent. That was the purpose why the Quran was revealed. To bring people from darkness into light. So evil, misguidance, misfortune, difficulties, trouble, hardship, trials is equal to darkness. And if we recite Surah Al-Kahf, which is not just reciting it, but it is also to read and understand and implement what we find in it, then Allah is going to give us light, which will remove us from that darkness. This is the significance of Surah Al-Kahf. Once there was a companion, it is a Sahih Hadith, which has been reported, narrated in, or report recorded in Sahih Al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. A companion, some narrations say that he is a companion named Usaid. He was sitting in the compound, his compound, the compound of his house, home, and reciting Surah Al Kahf. His camel was tied outside, and when he was, as he began reciting this Surah, Surah Al Kahf, his camel became restless. And he happened to look up and he found some clouds. Very peculiar clouds descending closer and closer to earth. As soon as he stopped reciting, the clouds went up and the camel became quiet. So he went to Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and narrated what happened. And Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Shouldn't you have continued to recite? Because what you saw were the angels who were descending upon earth in order to listen to what you were reciting." So this shows that this surah al-Kahf has a magical effect. It brings a sense of tranquility. And Prophet ﷺ mentioned it to that companion. He said, those angels will be bringing tranquility because this Quran brings about tranquility. The companions of Prophet ﷺ used to recite Quran in order to bring peace in their minds. They used to find solace in the recitation of the Quran. But today we are doing it like uh, some thing that is a burden upon us. We find it very difficult to take the Quran and recite it. Because we do not feel the importance of reciting the Quran. So maybe if we are able to grasp some of the meanings of this Quran and its benefits, then inshallah, this will bring us closer to the Quran and help us spend more time with it. So this uh, hadith or narrations which speak about the virtue and blessings of this surah is enough to make us study this surah to see what are the teachings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us through the verses that are found there. This surah is a Makki surah, which means it was revealed in Makkah. And we mentioned that 
it was revealed in the latter part of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam's Meccan da'wah when he and the Muslims, the companions, were persecuted physically. Whereas in the earlier stages of the da'wah, they were just ridiculed or they were rejected. But here in this stage, they were being persecuted physically, harmed. They were being ill-treated. Several hardships were put upon them. So it was during this period that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is revealing. But there are some narrations which have been said by Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu and some tabi'een like Imam Qatada and others which mention some specific verses of this surah like the verse ayah number 28 and some of the ayah the verses towards the end of this surah that these particular verses were revealed in Medina. But if we generally look at this surah at what it says we see that what this surah says is similar to what all the other Makki surahs speak about. Because as you all know, the Makki surahs speak about belief, the various parts of belief, which is mainly belief in Allah, Tawheed, belief in His Risala the message of Allah, prophets, books and Al-Akhirah, death and the life hereafter. So this surah also is speaking about those aspects, which means that this surah also has to be a Maki surah. This is the 18th chapter of the Quran, it has 110 verses. But this surah is different from the other surahs because the larger part of this surah are narration, stories. Out of the 110 verses, more than 70 ayah verses of this surah are stories. And we mentioned last week that four main stories are being narrated in this surah. Surah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking about Tawheed, belief in Allah, He is speaking about the Risala, the message, prophethood and so on and He is also speaking about the hereafter through these narrations which makes it more interesting for us to read and understand. But this surah, it begins by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It begins by the words Alhamdulillah. In surah Al-Fatiha, we studied the significance of Alhamdulillah. Surah Al-Fatiha, according to the scholars who don't regard Bismillah as one of its verses also begins with Alhamdulillah and there are about four surahs in the Quran which begin with Alhamdulillah but when we look at Surah Al-Fatiha Allah is saying Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Praise be to Allah. Why? Because He is the Lord of the worlds. What does it mean for Allah to be the Lords of the worlds? It means that He is providing for them. He is protecting them. He is making it, looking after it. So, we are thanking Allah in Surah Al-Fatiha for providing us 
with all forms of sustenance in this life because we are praising Allah because he is the Lord he is the Rabb of the entire universe but here in Surah Al-Kahf we are beginning with the same Alhamdulillah praise be to Allah we are thanking Allah but we are mentioning a different aspect we are saying Alhamdulillahi anzala Alhamdulillahi alladhi anzala ala abdihi al-kitab anzala means to reveal and we have many times mentioned the difference between anzala and nazala I don't want to go to it again but anzala means we revealed this book the Quran to our servant Allah is saying we revealed this book to our servant to our slave and what does Allah mean by our slave Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so this is something strange this is something we in this world regard as a slave as the person with the lowest status a slave is a person with the lowest status but who is Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he is the leader of all people he was the best of mankind so how come Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by our slave is this a sign of respect this is what we should pay attention to one of the main purposes of this surah is to change the way we look at things our perspective of the various things that we perceive in our surroundings is different in the light of Islam how do we look at wealth how do we look at power how do we look at status the way we look at them is different from how Allah expects us to look at them this surah attempts to change our view to change our perception of these things that surround us and one of them is this word which is the slave in Islam if you are Allah's slave then that is the peak of dignity that gives you the highest status the more you prove yourself to be a true and sincere slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the more you elevate in status you go higher and higher this is what Allah wants us to understand if you want status if you want to be a man of dignity then it does not come by becoming a slave of wealth it does not come out of becoming a slave to women but it comes only by proving yourself to be a true servant of Allah and this is the purpose of Iman this is the aim of Iman to make a Muslim a true servant of Allah and this is what the surah is teaching us so alhamdulillah illadhi anzala ala abdihi al-kitab and the amazing thing is that Allah addresses Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with this word slave in occasions where Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was actually 
dignified by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, glorified by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For instance, one of the incidents which happened at the time of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which showed Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's great status was the incident, the event of what? Mi'raj. The word Mi'raj itself means to, to ascend. He went up to the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So is there any status higher than this? No. And when Allah is speaking about this Isra wal Mi'raj, in Surah Al-Isra, how is Allah saying? Subhanalladhi asra bi abdihi laylam min al-masjid al-haram ila al-masjid al-aqsa. Subhanalladhi asra bi abdihi. He is the one who took his servant, his slave on the journey of Isra. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So therefore this surah is opening with a verse which opens our eyes to the reality of human existence. We are being told to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this first verse of Surah Al-Kahf is directly related to the last verse of the Surah that preceded it. Which is Surah Al-Isra. In Surah Al-Isra, the final verse, it says, وَقُولِ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ الَّذِي لَمْ يَتَّخِذْ وَلَدًا And say, Alhamdulillah. Say, praise be to Allah who has not taken for himself any children. Who does not have children. Subhanallah. Praise be to him. Say, say Alhamdulillah was the final verse of Surah Al-Isra and Surah Al-Kahf which comes thereafter begins by saying Alhamdulillah. And it says Alhamdulillah alladhi anzala ala abdihi al-kitab wa lam yaj'al lahu iwaja. And the following verses once again negates the possibility of Allah having children. It warns the people who say that Allah has a son, like the people of Trinity. It says that this is something that is not rational and cannot be accepted. So, Alhamdulillah, why is this surah beginning with Alhamdulillah? This surah, as I mentioned in the previous lesson, is showing us the way how to save ourselves from the evils of materialism. Materialism. Now how did materialism come into effect? How did materialism spread in this world? One extreme led to the other extreme. The Christians they used to believe in this trinity. They used to believe that there was God and there was the Son and there was the Holy Spirit. But when the Christians began to go to the Muslim countries and study the various sciences that Islam used to spread and they returned to their countries and started teaching these sciences, which are maybe mathematics, which may be astronomy, which may be geography or anything, all these they learnt at the hands of the Muslims. And when they returned to their countries and tried to teach the people about this, 
they found that these were clashing with the teachings of Christianity. So the Christian preachers, they waged a war against these people. Why is it that we find that so many scientists lived a very wretched life? Most of them were very poor when they died. Scientists. Why is it? Because there was no room for them. The Christians were against them and treated them as their enemies because science will open up the eyes, open the minds of the people and they will begin to think about these concepts that were being preached as to be Christianity. So they were dead against them. So once they started oppressing these people, those people in return began to hate the Christian preachers. They used to hate them. And this was what led to the renaissance of the European countries, of the Western countries. And once they were able to develop, once they were able to enhance their lives, the Christians began, became their dead enemies. Which means that they hated even religion because Christianity was their religion. And if they hated religion, they will also hate God. So they don't have faith in God. Then in which, in, in what do they have faith in? They have faith in their powers, their physical abilities, their scientific experiments, discoveries, and so on. And this is what materialism is about. You totally depend on material gains. You totally depend on material physical benefits and you think that is life and you forget the spiritual aspect of it. So now here Allah is reminding us about this spiritual aspect in our life and he is saying Alhamdulillah illadhi anzala ala abdihi al-kitab In Surah Al-Fatiha we were praising, thanking Allah for sustaining us. In this surah, we are thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guiding us. How? By revealing this Quran. Alhamdulillah illadhi anzala ala abdihi al-kitab. Ala abdihi al-kitab. The scholars of tafsir point out a very, uh, a very fine difference between Alhamdulillah in Surah Al-Fatiha and Alhamdulillah in this Surah. Alhamdulillah in Surah Al-Fatiha is an, is a form of telling us to thank Allah. It means when Allah says Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, Allah means that Allah is the Lord of the universe, therefore you should thank him. So it is enjoining upon us to say Alhamdulillah. But here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not saying Alhamdulillah in that same sense. But he is, he is pronouncing a reality. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is able to reveal this Quran which does not have any forms of any forms of uh, diverged thoughts any forms of contradiction which does not have any complexity if Allah is able to reveal such a form of guidance then surely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should be praiseworthy. So therefore, all praise is due to him. So there we were expected to praise Allah and thank Allah, but here Allah is saying that Allah is praiseworthy. Allah is glorious. Allah, all praise should be to him because he is the one who has given you this guidance. Alhamdulillah, 
is something very important. Just by saying Alhamdulillah, we are earning a lot of rewards. Which is why Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, At-Tahuru Shatrul Iman. We all know this hadith. Cleanliness is half of Iman. Walhamdulillah Tamla ul Mizan. The the words Alhamdulillah will weigh upon our scales. It will fill our scales. It's going to fill up our scales. Just saying Alhamdulillah. Wa subhanallah wa alhamdulillah tamla'u ma bayna samawati wal ard. And saying Subhanallah and Alhamdulillah is going to fill what is between the sky and the earth. So these words of saying Alhamdulillah, why is it so significant? Because the first step towards faith in Allah, the first step towards total belief in Allah is for us to feel a sense of gratitude towards Allah. If we do not feel this sense of gratitude, if we do not want to thank Allah, then we are not ready to have faith in Him. So understanding why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so praiseworthy is the first step towards having total faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just imagine, we have been blessed with a lot of, lot of things. We are born as Muslims. We are born as Muslims. And because we are Muslims, we are refraining from a lot of evil deeds that are abundant in the other communities. Do you know how significant that is? Do we realize what a great blessing that is? So the very fact that we have been born as Muslims is one of the greatest blessings that Allah has bestowed upon us. Just imagine that if this Quran, if this Quran had not been revealed, what would have our lives been like? Today how much we are attached to this Quran. We are reciting Quran in our prayers. We are reciting, our children are, every day they are studying the Quran. They are learning to read the Quran. All the bayans, all the speeches, all the books written on Islam are quoting verse after verse from the Quran. Because it is only the Quran that can guide us. It is only the Quran that can advise us. So all these are blessings of Allah. If we do not understand this, we will not be thankful to him. So Alhamdulillah, if you understand, if you know the value of this book, then you have to attribute all praise to Allah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah alladhi anzala ala abdihi al-kitab. Praise be to him who revealed this book to his slave. Walam yaj'al lahu ibaja. And he did not make in it or he did not uh, leave room in it for any forms of distortion. Iwaj, the Arabic word Iwaj, I'm sorry, the PowerPoint presentation, I could not uh, prepare it this time, but inshallah, in future lessons, we will be able to go through the PowerPoint presentation, inshallah. So, the Arabic word Iwaja, Iwaja means a road which is not straight. Mu'waj, we say a road which is which has a lot of curves, we say tariq mu'waj. It is a road which is not straight. So even a person's thinking can be mu'waj. If a person does not think straightly, then we say that his thought is crooked. He is not thinking straight. So Allah is saying, his book is, there is no room, Allah left no room for any deviance, any, any forms of crookedness or any forms of uh, uh, distortion, Allah did not leave room in his book. On the contrary, 
it is qayyima qayyima it is a straight way it shows us the straight way the word qayyim you would have heard the imam ibn qayyim ibn qayyim qayyim means to be straight but there is another meaning if you say kitabun qayyim kitabun qayyim it also means a valuable book so qayyim means number one it's something that is straight number two is something that is valuable that is treasured so this book allah has revealed it in such a manner that there is no distortion in it on the contrary it is a straight book which means it shows us the straight way and it is very valuable what is the message of this book liyunzira ba'san shadidan min ladun the first message that allah is giving in this book is a warning a warning not just an ordinary warning allah is saying liyunzira bi ba'san shadidan ba's means tribulation ba's means hardship ba's could also mean punishment not some slight punishment but very severe punishment and allah is using that word ba's and also saying shadid which means strong heavy severe so this book is warning of severe punishment from allah min ladunhu means from him from allah at the same time it also brings glad tidings for whom for the believers wa yubashshir al mu'minin bashshara means to give glad tidings wa yubashshir al mu'minin but not all believers al mu'minin alladhina ya'malun as salihat the believers who do good deeds the believers who do good deeds so the quran what is its message it warns the people who reject the call of allah at the same time it brings glad tidings to those who believe in allah and also do good deeds now here we should think about an important fact that iman is not something that idles in the minds of the people iman is not something that remains stagnant within the people iman is something that will always urge us to do good deeds we cannot regard ourselves as true believers true mu'mins if our belief is not reflected in action which is why allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying in this in these verses al mu'minin alladhina ya'maluna as salihat the believers who do good deeds so by believing in allah by accepting allah by saying the kalima and by believing in allah's prophets by believing in the quran by reciting it by studying it alone no action action we believe in order to practice we study in order to implement we understand in order to do this has to be the true mu'min so it is such type of believers that allah says wa yubashshir al mu'minin alladhina ya'maluna as salihat anna lahum ajran hasana the people who reject ba's shadid very severe punishment the people who believe and do good deeds ajran hasana very beautiful very good splendid rewards 
And Allah is saying, ma kithina fihi abada. Makatha means to stay in a place. To prolong your stay in one place is called makatha. So ma kithina fihi abada. Not just, Allah is not saying that you will get the best of rewards. He is saying that you will be able to continuously stay with those rewards. Abada. Abada means eternal forever why is Allah mentioning this that you will not only be gain, getting good rewards but you will also be experiencing those rewards forever because this surah wants to show us the importance of belief and good deeds in contrast to what we believe to bring happiness and comfort, which are wealth and material gains. Those wealth and material gains, as we know, are not everlasting. They come and they go. We acquire them and then we lose them. But Allah is saying, the pleasure, the satisfaction, the happiness that you get through Allah's rewards, stay with you forever you are not going to lose them it is not going to leave you ma kithina fihi abada you will be with it forever subhanallah that is what we are all searching for in this world that is what we are all yearning for peace of mind happiness and allah is saying this will be eternal for you if you believe in allah and do good deeds but as for those people who reject they will be punished severely. And again Allah is repeating that warning. Because attributing any relationship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or saying that Allah has a son is one of the worst forms of shirk. It shows that you don't believe in Allah at all. You don't have any faith in him, in his ability, in his power. So Allah is once again warning those people who say so. وَيُنزِرَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا اتَّخَذَ اللَّهُ وَلَدَ مَا لَهُمْ بِهِ عِلْمٍ Why are they saying so? Because they don't have knowledge of it. They are just saying what their forefathers said. Did they realize, did they ponder over what they are saying? Did they think about it? Had they thought about it? They would have understood the mistake. They would have understood that what they are saying is wrong, but they didn't think about it. They don't have knowledge about it. Who taught them about it? Who told them that Allah has or God has any relations? Nobody told them. So they don't have knowledge about it. مَا لَهُمْ بِهِ مِنْ عِلْمٍ وَلَا لِآبَائِهِمْ Even their forefathers did not know about it. They did not understand who Allah is. Then what was their mistake? Kaburat kalimatan takhruju min afwahihim. Kaburat kalimatan takhruju min afwahihim. The words which come out of their mouth are not simple words. They are disastrous words. They bring about disaster and calamities upon them. Kaburat means, kabir means big. Kabir means big. Kabura means it became big. So kaburat kalimatan, kalima means word. Afwah is the plural of fam or fa, which means mouth. So the word that comes out of their mouth is not simple, it's very big, which means its consequences are very big. So they just say about Islam that and this, they ridicule the teachings of Islam. They say about Allah things that do not suit him, befit him. And they do not realize the consequences of those words. Kaburat kalimatan takhruju min afayt. In yakuluna illa kadiba. All they are saying is nothing but kadib. What is kadib? Kadib means lies. What they are saying is not truth. Now, Allah is saying that what they are saying is not truth in order to say 
that what this Quran has brought is nothing but the truth. What this Quran has brought has, is nothing but the truth. So these are the first four verses of this surah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is emphasizing who Allah is. Who Allah is. At the same time, He is reminding us of Allah's blessings upon us by revealing the Quran. By revealing the Quran, Allah has showered upon us one of, his, one of the greatest blessings. One of the greatest blessings. So, we, if we realize, if we realize the glory of this Quran, then we will naturally thank Allah for having revealed to us this Quran. And we will also respect the messenger of Allah who taught us that Quran and lived the life of Quran so as to set an example to us as to how we could live as true Muslims. So still we have not come to the, the, the narrations that have been mentioned in this surah. It begins in verse number 9. It is from verse number 9 that the narrations begin and the first narration, the first story is the story of Ashab al-Kahf. All these verses that come before that is a prelude to that. It is preparing us to understand those stories. Because when we read something, we should know the purpose for which it has been written. What is the purpose of this book? What does this book want to say? What is the message it needs to convey? So Allah is saying, these narrations are all going to teach you how to have true faith in Allah. How to place your trust completely in Allah. Because it is only by having true faith in Allah and completely placing your trust in Allah that you will be able to rid yourself from all hardship and all trouble. This is what we see in the story of the people of the cave. This is what we see in the story of the person who had two gardens. And this is what we see in the story of Musa and Khidr alayhi salam or the pious servant. And this is what we see in the story of Zulkarnain. All these stories pinpoint to one fact that it is complete faith in Allah and trust in Him that will lead us to success. Anything other than that will only lead towards destruction. And we do not have knowledge of that. It is only Allah who can reveal to us what is good for us and what is bad for us. Because the knowledge we have is limited. So these are the things that have been uh, mentioned and as I have said, one of the main uh, themes of this surah is to remove, remove all forms of misconception from Iman. Our Iman is an Iman which is, which is sleeping in our hearts. It is not an Iman which is live. So we need to give life to that Iman. And through these stories, we will be able to realize where our Iman is. Where our Iman is. Where we stand from this Iman. We will understand the reality of this Iman. That this Iman is what will lead us towards success in this life. Without this Iman, without true faith, we will not be able to succeed in this life. We will not be able to confront the evils that are found in our society. And we will succumb to the, the attractions of materialism in this world. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enlighten us with the teachings of this surah and help us overcome the challenges that we face in this materialistic world. So that we are able to devote ourselves to the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Be obedient to Him. Be thankful to Him. So that He will 
Take us by our hands and guide us on the straight path. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive our sins. Forgive the sins of all our relations and all our friends and the Muslim community. May Allah guide our Muslim community towards the straight path. Bless that community with peace and prosperity. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help all our Muslim brothers and sisters who are facing numerous challenges in various parts of the world. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save them from the treacherous plans and the evil deeds of the enemies of Islam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our du'as and bless us all with Jannatul Firdaus. Amin wa akhir da'awana. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen.